Well, thank you for joining us. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you would, go ahead and open up to the book of Daniel in chapter number 5. Daniel chapter 5 this morning as we continue learning about Daniel, some truths from God's Word, and looking at the, the one particular account there of the writing on the wall began this last Sunday morning, and I did not get through it, as you can imagine, I typically don't. But I love the truths here, and I have enjoyed, so enjoyed the book of Daniel. And I have enjoyed studying about Daniel, and next week we're going to hit Daniel and the lion's den, the good Lord willing. Uh, What a familiar story, what a great truth for us from that account as well. You may see some sermon things this week, and kind of build some anticipation toward next Sunday morning as well. But I'm looking forward to finishing up the writing on the wall, and uh, i I got to just... Talk, pause real quick and just talk to the church family real quick. I, I so miss being with all of you. And I had the question, well, when are we going to meet and come back together again? And I have a tremendous answer. I have no idea. All right. But as soon as we can, we will. All right. It's not, I am not ignoring this situation. I think you know me better than that. And I'm not running from the situation. I'm trying to navigate as wisely. So many of you have, have mentioned that you're praying for us and praying for me in particular. And I appreciate that so much. And as soon as we can, we will. All right. I miss shaking your hands by the back door. I miss seeing your smiling faces. I miss you sleeping through my sermon. I know you are. I just can't see you right now sleeping through my sermon. And uh, nodding off, and I, there's so many uh, things that, that you, you, you miss, and many of you have expressed the exact same thing. You expressed that, hey, for first week, second week, this is fun in our pajamas, but now we're ready to get back together as a church family, and I am leading that charge, but we're trying to navigate this as well as we can and uh, be a good testimony. Part of what we're navigating through is we're a larger congregation, all right? We don't have just 25 people. God's been so gracious to us with the size of our church, but because of that, there's some different bridges that we have to cross as a slightly larger congregation that maybe some other congregations don't have to walk through the same way. But we're looking at it, and I I missed you. And if you get bored, you call us, and we'll send you right to voicemail. It'll be wonderful. And you leave a nice long message, and we'll delete that and then pretend we listen to it. It'll be just a special thing for us. No, but we miss you. Open the Bible to Daniel chapter 5. Last week we began on this uh, this thought, all right, this message on the writing on the wall. Remember that with the writing on the wall, the... The history behind that phrase is from this passage. The meaning, even in current day, is based off this passage, and that it means that there are clear signs that a situation is about to become very difficult or unpleasant. Writing on the wall, that phrase is not a positive phrase. It is, uh, by definition, a negative phrase because of this passage right here, Daniel chapter 5. You know that God's Word influences us in ways we don't even realize? It influences cultures in ways we don't even realize, and this is because of God's word, the writing on the wall. We looked at last week how how if we become too self-centered, if we make life all about us, the merriment, the party that was going on, it was the foundation for God dealing with them. You know that God desires us to acknowledge him in our lives? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. Lean not to your face mask, you know, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, not just your stimulus money, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. And what will he do? He shall direct thy paths. I'm wondering this morning if you're leaving God out of your life. Have you ever had this experience like I had again the other day? I left the office. Like I'm apt to do, driving home, I mine somewhere else, and the next thing you know, I'm pulling into my garage. I don't know who I passed. I don't know how fast I was going. I don't know which route I really took. Now I imagine I took the same route that I take every day, right down Dixie Highway, take a right on Curtis, and take a left on Morse, and then I'm home. Have you ever been in a place like that where you get there, you're like, wow, I just got there, and I was not paying attention at all. Wouldn't it be a scary thought? Wouldn't it be sad if, as Christians, we were living and not realizing God as part of our life? It's one thing to get somewhere and realize, boy, I was disconnected. I was thinking about somewhere else. It's entirely another matter if I live a week of my life and realize that God has been over here the whole time, but I didn't even acknowledge Him. I didn't realize that that he was a part of my life. I was in that quasi space like I am sometimes when I drive. Or maybe even sitting in a chair and drinking a cup of coffee like I'm also apt to do. 
Your mind goes off, and the next thing you know, you look down, boy, 15 minutes. Well, what just happened? I don't know. What were the kids doing? I have children. What's going on? And, and wouldn't it though be scary to sit in the, light, the, in the chair of life and not have God be your all, be a part of it? This morning, I want to challenge us to acknowledge God in our lives. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. Lord, help us as we look at your word. You'd guide and direct our steps in our life and our heart right now. Lord, give me the wisdom and strength to say those things that will, will further your kingdom. We'll challenge us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. We looked at last week in Daniel chapter 5, the first four verses. They were having a banquet, a thousand lords, plus some wives and some servants. And they had went and, and gathered the, the vessels from the... Uh, from the siege on Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel was brought from Jerusalem and Nebuchadnezzar, all right, the father of this king Belshazzar, had brought back not only Daniel and his friends and some others, he had brought back the storehouses from the temple. And they had brought back gold and some special silver vessels. Well, during this banquet, Belshazzar was having such a grand time and so rejoicing in what he had done and his gods had done that they said, well, go get those vessels. So they brought them. In verse number five, we see God's attention grabbing technique. You know that God always knows how to get our attention. He knows exactly how to get your attention and exactly how to get my attention, and those can be different. What gets your attention may not even phase me. What gets my attention may not bother you, but God always knows how to get our attention. What does he use? Whatever he wants to use. And in this particular story, in verse number 5 and 6, we're going to see what God used for the king and his princes and his wives and all his servants. He used the writing on the wall. Look at verse number 5, if you would, in 6. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed. I love that. <laughs> Don't talk to me about sarcasm. Read your Bible. The king's countenance, you better believe it was changed. The Bible goes on to describe how it was changed. His thoughts troubled him. You better believe it. What does it say? So that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. I will demonstrate. His knees were knocking as fast as they could, right? That's what it says. His knees knocked one against you. That's what it says. I love the Bible. Does it not paint a picture for you? Can you not see this happening? They are sitting there drinking out of the holy vessels. The vessels consecrated to, to God and the worship of God. Special, special vessels. They were they were. And they were making a mockery of them. And God in his power manifested himself with a man's hand writing on the wall. And the king, the Bible says the king saw it. Of course he did because God made sure that he saw it because God always knows how to get our attention. He saw it and he sees it. And I, you know, I, I've seen some pictures of this. Maybe you have as well. And, and the, the letters were, in the pictures that I've seen were glowing. Maybe they were gold color and they were all lit up on the wall. We don't know what they looked like on the wall. I don't know if he carved into the plaster, if it was deep grooves or if it was on fire or if it was, you know, lightning coming off the fingers. All right. Who knows? It doesn't particularly matter because what does matter is there is fingers in a hand. With no body, just suspended in the air. Almost like it was magic. Almost. Except that it wasn't. Now, when I was younger, I delved into the little card trick, little, little games. And I had like this, this uh, deck of trick cards. I was maybe 11 or 12, somewhere right in there. I had a, I had a magic thumb. In this thumb, it would slip over your thumb and you could hide things inside of it, you know, and then pull it out. It was, it, I thought it was awesome. And my parents were so kind to humor me and say, wow, you know, and I could, with the cards, the cards were tapered. 
All right, so you could, you know, you'd flip the deck around and you could easily p- p- pick out whatever card they had. To, I don't know that sleight of hand stuff. I had to use cheats along the way. And it's like, oh, is this your card, Mom? Oh, yes, that's my card. How'd you do that? You know, as the instructions, as I'm reading the instructions, you know, during the trick. All right, turn card around. Okay, yeah, there it is. No, not quite that bad, but it seems that way, right? I've enjoyed watching uh, sometimes on a YouTube, occasional YouTube fling, uh, sleight of hand tricks, and some of those people are just masters at distraction and fast with their fingers right and and like how do they do that and they'll they'll slow it down and you still can barely see what they do right man just and then and then <clears throat> you'll see sometimes illusions but let me tell you folks this was no sleight of hand trick that happened on the wall this was no copperfield illusion that happened on the wall this was god almighty all right getting the attention of this king And boy, did he get his attention. You know, let me tell you this. You never have to wonder. You never have to wonder if God is speaking to you. All right, he is. And when God speaks, it will be clear. Sometimes something bad will happen. Someone will say, well, is God punishing me for something else? And let me tell you, I don't believe from the Bible that God ever punishes without clear clear communication. He's a, he's a father, he calls us a good father, a perfect, a perfect father for us. And no sooner would I, would I take my kids and just start to discipline them and, well, what's going on, daddy? You know, you figure it out. I wouldn't do that as a father, and I'm just an earthly father. Our heavenly father, he doesn't operate, I believe, that way at all. God communicates clearly, and this was no illusion, this was no sleight of hand, this was God himself getting the attention of these people boy when God wants our attention he knows how to get it some have claimed that this COVID-19 is just to get our attention now there's no doubt in my mind that God wants to use it that way there's no doubt there are some lessons that we ought to learn from this time I hope that you are using the time to the fullest with your family I hope that you're, I appreciate what was said Wednesday night from Brother Dylan and Brother Cowling and, and new ways to reach people, but also new ways to communicate with your family. I hope that you're having a great time with your family. I hope you're playing some games. Some of you have noticed on Facebook that we've played some family games and I've won a couple and lost a whole bunch. I don't know if my wife posted the Connect Four tournament. Yes, if she hasn't, there's a reason for that. And it's not because I told her not to post it. I had a better run on the Connect Four tournament. And I hope you're using this time, but what does God want from you? But when God really wants your attention, he knows exactly how to get it. And right here, he got their attention. It wasn't sleight of hand. It wasn't illusion. It wasn't some fancy video editing. This was God himself speaking, demonstrating himself. But what struck me in verse number 7, then the king cried aloud, if you would, in verse 7, to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof, shall be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. You ever notice how people think money can solve all life's problems? Listen, if you do this, I'll give you a whole lot of riches. Money can solve a lot of problems, it seems like, but money can't solve any problem with God. This wasn't a financial problem. This was a spiritual problem. He can throw all the money of his whole kingdom at it. He couldn't solve this problem without God intervening. Verse 8, then came all the king's wise men. But they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled and his countenance was changed in him. And his lords were astonished, astonished. He called the smartest people he could. He called the experts. He called the ones that for sure could read this writing on the wall. And they came up with a big fat zero. They they didn't know what this said. They They couldn't figure out what happened. And because of that, Belshazzar now knew this was even bigger than when it first started. Remember when it first started, his knees were knocking. Well, now it got so bad that his... The wise men, the lords, they saw that. And they were worried now because he was even more concerned. 
Something happens in verse 10. Something, I think, that will be a challenge and an encouragement to us. Something that will carry on as we preach next week as well. You see, because in this kingdom, there was a man who was known to be connected to God. In this kingdom, there was a man who was known to have a spirit of the living God that dwelled inside of him. All right, A man who had continually had a testimony that pleased God, and he was known that way. For whatever reason, Daniel didn't show up the first time. And all of a sudden, the queen, in verse number 10, begins to speak up. And in verse, in verse 11, she goes, There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in thy days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. And Christian, my friend, I want to challenge you to be known as Daniel was known back then. Of whom everyone will know that inside of you and inside of me, there is the spirit of the holy gods. And there is light and wisdom. You see, Daniel had a testimony. And his testimony was not that he was in it for money. It was not that he was smart or handy. It was not that he was intelligent. It was that he knew the holy God. He knew the God of the universe. Verse 12, For as much then as there is an excellent spirit in knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and of dissolving of doubts, the end of the verse says, Now let Daniel be called. You ever notice that when trouble comes, people turn to God? You ever notice that when some big calamity happens, all of a sudden, though we don't want God in the courthouse, we don't want the Ten Commandments on the wall, we don't want God in the school system, you can't pray at school, you, you can't pray here, and you can't mention God's name, all right? But, but all of a sudden, something bad happens, and people start to pray. And who do they pray to? Who do they pray to? They pray to God, don't they? I still remember... After 9-11, the attack on the World Trade Centers, I was in New York City just a few months later. I had, I had been around New York City many times before that because uh, my wife and I, she's from right outside the city. The city is just a hustle and bustle of people. I think at that time, I believe there's about 8 million people at that time, but don't quote me on that number. And it was, seems like almost a city that never shut down, that never sleep. It seems like you just could always find a little cafe open, a little cup of coffee at night in Times Square, just people all night long. After 9-11, I went to where the World Trade Towers were, and it was eerily silent. There was a senior trip somewhere in there as well, and those young people went with me. I think the Mitchells were with us on that trip, and it was strange. However else the... The, street, the streets are just bustling with activity, the honking of the taxi cabs, and you turn a corner and it was like silence. Even at that time, there were still candles lit in prayers. They were turning to God. How could this happen? I was reminded of when Kobe Bryant had his fatal helicopter crash. What did they do afterwards? They put up some prayer vigils, right? Now, we know that prayers for someone like that doesn't matter afterwards. All right, we don't believe that I can pray someone to heaven afterwards. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But I'm just pointing out the fact that, that in these troubling times, people all of a sudden, who had no, no mention of God before, had denial of God, all of a sudden say, oh, no, no, you better pray, we better pray. Now let Daniel be called. He, Daniel had a testimony. He was known as a Christian. Do your neighbors know your testimony? Do they know that in you there's the spirit of the holy gods? Do they know that if they get in trouble, well, I hope they, they call you because of your testimony? Do your co-workers know that you're a Christian? I don't mean that you come to First Baptist Church, but that there's something different about you. There's a different spirit about you, an excellent spirit, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of the holy God. Do you have a testimony? You see, Daniel had a testimony. A testimony so great that the queen said, now let Daniel get this guy in the room because if anybody can do it, he can do it. Amen. Now we know what was going on there, that it wasn't Daniel at all. It was God working through Daniel. But Daniel was in a place that God could use him. During this time of this pandemic, do you have a testimony? 
Or are you just like everybody else? Daniel was a wise man, but he was not like the other wise men. They could interpret dreams, but Daniel had a different understanding. Do you have a testimony? Don't let your testimony be marred. I read this story about a young lady who was going to go tour a mine, a coal mine. She showed up for the tour, as the story goes, with a clean white dress on. And the tour guy said, ma'am, um, you probably shouldn't wear this, this white dress into the coal mine. As the story goes, she responded, well, sir, I want to wear this dress. Is there a problem? And his response, the tour guy said, well, ma'am, he goes, you can enter this coal mine with a white dress, but the odds of you leaving with it like that are very slim. <laughs> Testimony. You know, the, we're washed, we're, we're cleansed, and we're supposed to be, as the Bible says, unspotted from the world. A testimony. A testimony that says, God, you can work through me. God, you can use me. God, I am yours. God, I want to have a life that pleases you. I want to acknowledge you in all my ways. And maybe when someone hits a calamity, they'll know to call you or to call me, and you'll be the voice of God in their life. I've shared this account before, but there's a gentleman that I've had some acquaintance with. Witness told him he's not saved, not trusted Christ as a Savior. And one time he asked me, he goes, J.D., did you put a curse on me? I haven't. I don't have that ability. Now, don't ask me if I've ever wanted to put a curse on somebody, but I, don't ask me that question, but of course I can't. I said, no. I said, but until you turn to God... Your life will always, will always stink. Without God, our life always stinks. And they called Daniel, who had a testimony. Daniel, who had a, a message. Daniel interpreted the dream. He inter I'm sorry, he interpreted the writing on the wall. You can find that interpretation in verses 17 through, through 28. But in verse 22, I believe the key to the message that Daniel brought is found in verse 22, where Daniel says, And thou his son, O Belshazzar, son of Nebuchadnezzar, son of the one who, remember, was cast outside for seven years and wandered around like an animal, the one who turned to God after that time, and thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Belshazzar, you knew better. Belshazzar, you knew. You knew who God was. You knew who God is. You knew what he could do. You knew the testimony of your father. You knew the God of the universe. And you should have turned toward him. But you didn't humble your heart. You should have known better, Belshazzar. You should have responded differently. You should have humbled your heart. When I was studying this, it touched my heart. Because I'm a Christian. I know God. But there are times that I make wrong choices. I should know better. I should humble my heart. Belshazzar was a pagan, though he had plenty of opportunity to turn to God. And that's what Daniel is saying, what God is saying through Daniel. A Christian, boy, this hits you and myself as well. It hits us as well. We know better. We should have responded differently. I have the truth. I can look at it every single day. I have no excuses. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. But I'm so glad that our God is a patient God. I read this. There was one time an American, American named Robert Ingersoll. He was an atheist, and he often would deliver addresses against God, Jehovah. It was after one such of his addresses, as the story goes, that he pulled out his stopwatch from his pocket. And he said, God in the Bible would often kill men for blasphemy. I will give this God, as he said, five minutes to strike me down. He turned down the stopwatch. One minute passed. Two minutes passed. And people began to get nervous as this account went. And three minutes passed. And four minutes they said a lady passed out. Five minutes, nothing happened. He stopped the stopwatch and said, You see, there is his words, there is no God, or he would have taken me at my word. 
Someone heard the story afterwards. A Christian. The Christian said this. And did Mr. Engersoll think that he could exhaust the patience of God in just five minutes? I am so glad that God's patience is not exhausted in five minutes. Because if it was, I would not be standing here before you, and I doubt any of you would be here or at home listening. I'm so glad that we have a patient and a loving God. But don't mistake his patience for indifference. Don't miss the fact that at some point, that at some point, God says, no, no, Belshazzar, now you're done. You've crossed the line. You should have known better. But, but God is such a patient God. Don't ignore him. Don't ignore him when he wants your attention. Don't ignore him when he wants to touch your heart or your life. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And don't miss the fact that God desires a humble heart. A heart that acknowledges him. A heart that is turned toward him. A heart that wants to please him. And how much of our heart does he want? All of it. Every bit of it. He doesn't want any holdouts in my heart or your heart. He wants us to love him. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. James chapter 4 verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Does God want your attention? He knows how to get it. But I'd say let's give it to him before he has to work to get it. He's trying this morning to get your attention and my attention. He wants to, through his word, touch our heart. He wants us to respond to him. And you may be listening this morning and you may not know that you are on your way to heaven. Listen, my friend, God wants you to know that he loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And if you trust him and him alone, he'll save you. He'll save you and take you to heaven when you die. The Bible says you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. My friend, if you're not saved, if you've never trusted Christ, then please, would you trust him today? God wants your attention. My friend is a Christian. Do you have your heart? You know better. I know better. Belshazzar was held accountable because he, he, because he was supposed to have known better. You and I will be held accountable for whom much is given, much more shall be required. I want to acknowledge God in all my ways and walk humbly with him. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your power, for your grace, for your patience. Lord, help us to respond to you like we ought to. Lord, I'm glad you're a patient God, that it's not easily exhaustible. Lord, may we not wear your patience thin. May we respond to you. Christian, this morning, if God's touched your heart, would you spend time with him? Would you bend a knee, whether you're here or whether you're at home, and bend your heart toward him? In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Oh, I don't want God to have to write on my wall to get my attention. I want to listen to him when he speaks in a still, small voice. Friend, if you have that testimony that have others call you and know that God lives in you. And others you may be listening this morning and you may not be sure that you have a home in heaven. You can trust Christ today. Jesus Christ came to earth, born of Mary a virgin, lived a sinless and a holy life. He lived that life to come and die on the cross. He willingly died on the cross to pay for our sins. The Bible says that he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That means he is the payment for sins. For the wages of sin is death. That's payment. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the only way to pay for sin is separation from God. Jesus took that payment on himself 
And he took it so that you and I wouldn't have to. The Bible says that if we believe on him and call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're listening this morning and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, if you've never had Jesus forgive you from your sins, you can trust Christ today. Sometimes we help someone pray a simple prayer like this. It's not in the magic of the words. The Bible talks about it's a heart that we believe. The prayer goes something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again. Please say, I trust in Jesus and Him alone. If you've never trusted Christ, you can trust Him today. Maybe there's something going on inside of your heart you don't quite realize it. It could be the Spirit of God saying, listen, you need to do that. You need to trust me today. Would you trust Him today? Would you pray with me? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell Him. He'll hear you right where you're at. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and Him alone. If you prayed that just now and meant that, the Bible tells me, promises me and you that God did just that. He saved you. If you prayed that just now and you meant that, I'd love to rejoice with you. On your screen you'll see a, some information, a phone number, a website, email address. Would you send me a note? an email, leave a message. Say, Pastor, I, I prayed that and I meant that. I'd love to send you a free book to help you. I'm not asking you for anything. I'm not looking for money or nothing. I just want to help you grow as a Christian and rejoice with you. And if you did that today, would you let me know? I'd love to send you a little gift to help you grow as a Christian. Lord, I thank you for all you've done for us. Lord, thank you for speaking to us. And Lord, help us to live for you with a humble heart and acknowledge you in all our ways. In Jesus' name, amen.